So welcome to the history and future of crash dumps and FreeBSD. Uh, I'm Sam Guider. Uh, if you'd like, this is the repo where I have the slides and paper. Um, the paper has changed like one or two paragraphs, but the slides have been completely converted to Keynote. So if you're interested in that, you can find it right there. OK, so who am I? Uh, my name's Sam Guider. Uh, I went to Texas A&M University. I just graduated. I'm a computer engineer and computer science major with a minor in math. Uh, I've used Unix-like systems for 12 years. That's code name for Linux was most of those years. Um, somewhere in college, I got onto OpenBSD because I had like a security kick, and then I wanted to be I wanted ZFS, and so I was like, okay, FreeBSD. And so that's where I've been for the past four. Um, so what do I do at work? Uh, I work at Groupon. Uh, they have a ton of FreeBSD machines running their databases. And they crash sometimes. Um, so logs showed that the crash dumps were larger than our swap partitions. So uh, when I was asked to go look at these things, I was like, OK. Um, so we have to figure out what we can do about that. Turns out these dumps are very, very large, because we have 32 gigabyte swap partitions. And they were larger than that. And then I went in to look even further. And it turns out not only are some of these swap partitions small, they're non-existent. Um, so there was a bug in the provisioning script. And so there's many machines out there with no swap at all. So how do you get crash dumps without a swap partition or a very small swap partition? But I was still in school. So really what I have to justify is like a 14-page paper. Why do I have that? Well, if you're sitting in a technical uh, writing seminar, you need papers, and you need paper topics. Um, at the same time, if you guys haven't stumbled upon it, the Unix history repo is like really cool. It's a Git repository that combines the history of like Unix, like at and Research Unix, and then um, uh, later at and Unix, uh, all the BSDs, or no, sorry. Not like OpenNet and FreeBSD, but like 4, 3, and all that. And all the way up to FreeBSD 12. So I decided to combine my two issues at the time. I needed a paper. I needed to learn about crash dumps. So I wrote a long history of crash dumps in FreeBSD. So but what's the technical motivation? Um, I wanted to understand how crash dumps work, because I wanted to solve my missing or very small swap problem. Um, deciding on a solution and avoiding re reinventing the wheel was important because as I looked around, I found all these projects that like lived and died. NetDump is probably the best example. Uh, it's been around forever and it's still not hit the tree. And Unix history is always fun. So what's a crash dump, or sometimes called a core dump? That's core memory right there. Um, a machine readable form of the state of a machine at some point in time, usually after a panic. So it's essentially a dump of all memory at the time of a crash. And they're named, I often say core dump, crash dump's interchangeable. Most people mean, if they say crash dump, they mean the kernel, and core dump's for processes. But a core dump is named after this guy here. Each of those magnets contains one bit of information. I don't know how much information this is. I should have read the caption. But <laughs> that's RAM all the way up to like the 70s. OK, the history. So the paper contains a long history that's essentially like a list of features and crash dumps from 6th edition Unix all the way to 12 current. Um, so it's, I call it the Odyssey of Do a Dump. Do a Dump was added in like 6th edition FreeBSD and has been named the same function all the way through history. Um, but the paper starts at 6th edition, and it starts with a, a little introduction to core dumps in Crash 8 and then ends at FreeBSD 12 current when they added encrypted dumps. Uh, so turn to the appendix of that uh, paper in the repo I, I linked. If you'd like to see that, it includes architecture support, feature changes, and larger bu bug fixes. Uh, for even more depth, go to the org mode file on GitHub. It includes like individual commits where changes were made, mailing list emails, emails between me and authors, and just a bunch of notes. This is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, Rod Grimes helped me write some of this paper. And he had a quote. He was like, well, I remember in 1979, 
I can remember doing a crash dump on a Harris S210 24 bit machine to the line printer, and it only took two hours to print. <laughs> so, speeding these things up is, is uh, a problem that's been around for a while. So, here's a quick timeline of uh, the output formats of crash dumps. So, originally, like Rod was talking about, they're in, on line printers. Uh, later, they moved to magnetic tape when, when Unix came out. After that, paging area is what they refer to it in, in when it came out, but swap. And then now we're trying to get net, network dumping. I would love for that to come into the tree because that's the easiest way to get around no swap. <coughs> so there's a series of extensions, and this is partly why I wrote this history, is I, I came across these strange like changes like, okay, everybody has this interest in this esoteric area, but they never kind of come to fruition. Why is this? If I, if I come up with some crazy idea, is it doomed to follow the same path? You know, what, what should we do? So you end up looking through the years. This timeline starts in 2004. Uh, net dump started at Duke. That was earlier than 2004. Was it really? 1998. It was a guy that was working on it. Nice. So there you go. So it's been how many years? Maybe 1997, like something like that. OK. Yeah, because I know it's, it's a popular feature. OS X has it, and we're going to talk about that. But yeah, so and that's the same code if you were at the Dev Summit Mark Johnston was talking about, but just changed over time. Yeah, so you can see NetDump. All these dashed ones are, are ones that have not yet hit the tree. Uh, next is MiniDump, so it's far smaller uh, dumps. It's not the same size as your memory. If I were going to do a full dump on my current machines, I'd have to have 384 gigabytes of swap. Not really worth it. Um, after that, in 2008, uh, text dump was added by Robert Watson. Uh, and then we're working on compressed dump would solve my problem. Encrypted dump is cool and actually made it to tree. Modular dump is something Rod is actually talking about right now. So if you want to learn about that, <laughs> go across the hall. Um, and then mini dump size is something Rod also wrote which is an extension to estimate how large your dump will be before you do it. OK, so next I'm going to go over the general procedure of how a dump is taken. And then I'm going to go over all the features in FreeBSD. Uh, quick how-to, if you wanted to take a crash dump and you want to see how that works, we'll do that. Next, full dumps, mini dumps, which is the current default. What is a text dump? Why might you want them? And then a comparison between these three. So first, before I say anything, don't do this on your machine. If you're just blindly following and typing things in, please don't do this. Or actually do. If you do it, tell everybody. <laughs> but So you're purposely panicking your machine. So save your stuff. Um, your machine's probably already set up correctly, but you can set up the uh, uh, syscodals, or no, not syscodals, rcconf uh, configuration. So dump dev auto will find your swap partition, and then you'll dump there as soon as you write that last syscatal and panic your machine. OK, so how does a dump procedure work? Uh, this has been the same since 4.1 BSD all the way to right now. Um, so most OS have something almost exactly the same as this. Usually it's even the same uh, names. Um, so at the, at the time of a panic, you dump your RAM through the function dump sys to your swap partition. And then after a reboot, a program named save core runs, takes the dump from swap, and then loads it into var slash crash. Uh, so if you want to, I guess there's just more ways to panic your machine if you'd like. Uh, if you want to be fancy, you could use dtrace. Same thing now. Um, so dump sys lands all parts of memory on a swap in a particular format. So if it's a full dump, it's one format, mini dump another, text dump the last. Uh, and then on reboot, save core writes dump to the dumper for analysis. So what do you get in a core dump? Uh, well, there's three types, and they're slightly different. Uh, full dump and mini dumps are pretty much the same thing with different formats, whereas text dump's almost another thing altogether. Um, so the full dump and mini dump contents, there's three files. Uh, there's the info file, which is metadata about the dump. It's the time, panic string, host name, just like metadata. 
then the core text. It's a bunch of scripts that run uh, to give you the state of the machine. And the last is the core itself, VM core. So what does this format look like on swap? So dumps are written at the end of swap. So they're written from the end and then kind of going backwards as, a force, as opposed to starting at the beginning of swap and writing forward because programs like Fisk, when you boot, they assume that they can use the swap because nothing else is using it. So they just use the beginning. So there's kind of a, a dice roll that your dump won't be so close to the beginning of your swap partition that it'll get overwritten. Uh, save core makes sure that it's not like corrupted by Fisk by checking this leader here. And so if that leader's screwed up, then it just assumes the whole dump is screwed and just says forget about it. Um, so this is a full dump. So this is the full contents of memory at the time of crash. So like most of this is going to be zeros probably. Uh, it's an ELF format. And before it was ELF, it was A dot out format. So if you're into the history bit, go look at previous D6. Um, and so you can see the different parts in, in dump. So uh, a full dump is like a binary, right? So it's an ELF binary. Uh, there's a little bit of a header for save core, but the rest is just like most other binaries. So next is a mini dump. Uh, mini dumps were added in FreeBSD. I don't think I can hear myself. There you go. Okay. Mini dumps were added in FreeBSD 6.2 by Peter Wem. Uh, so they only contain memory pages in use, whereas a full dump will just contain all of memory. So this saves you a lot of space. This is much smaller. Um, modern dumps can still be fairly large. Um, so even though my machines make mini dumps, they're actually still too large to hit the swap. Um, these aren't an ELF format. They're a custom like mini dump format. It's its own thing. And it contains these things. It's written the same way as you can see, but I wanted to show it was relatively smaller. Okay, and the last type is a text dump. Uh, text dumps were added by Robert Watson in FreeBSD 7.1. Uh, the text dump facility allows the capture of kernel debugging information in, in a text form as opposed to just a, a binary. Uh, the issue is you do have to like script it. You have to know what you want ahead of time, and that's sort of the, the trade-off there is you can get these really tiny text files if you know what you're looking for. But if you don't know what you're looking for, you'll need these mini dumps or full dumps if you wanted to. Uh, so there's several different files in text dump. Uh, just these different files here contains the version that you're on, what your panic message was. Uh, the important part is the capture DDB output. So you script that a priori, and so you got to know what you're looking for. You can get a pretty good survey, but generally you know what you're looking for when you're using text dumps. So text dumps have a, a different on-disk format. It's just those files, one after the other in a tar. Um, the only interesting thing is actually he writes the trailer first and then moves all the way to the leader and then writes the whole thing again. And that's because he doesn't know the size before he writes the uh, dump because he hasn't run the DDB scripting. So why would you use uh, one format over another, a core dump versus a text dump? Um, so both are useful when crashes aren't predicted. So if you're in production, you're not going to pull up an online debugger and figure out what your problem is. You're going to put that machine right back into production, take your core, and go work on it um, so you can debug it offline. It also allows archiving of crash data for later comparison if you're trying to figure out, you know, we're having the same issue over and over again. Why is that happening? Um, and so core dumps, you don't need to know what you're looking for ahead of time, like I said. But you do need the source tree, debug symbols, and a kernel built for analysis. Whereas with text dumps, they're less complete, but they're like very, very small in comparison. Sometimes it's easier to extract information using DDB over KGDB than it is to get it out of a core dump. And then there's uh, another. I'm going to go over two more OSs and then like one tool that have to do with core dumps. 
This, the other OSs, I'm interested in those features and porting them to FreeBSD. And then the tool is just useful in production. Um, for OSs, we're going to cover Mac OS X and Illumos. And then there's one tool I'm going to cover, Backtrace.io. Uh, Sammy, who just walked in, if you, if you have more questions, go ask him. They're a sponsor of the conference. OK, so Mac OS X. Um, it's pretty different from the BSD Cordon procedure. Um, most of all, because they're using Mach O and not ELF. Um, and they have some neat features. They can do uh, dump to the local machine, but it's like sort of the default to do it over the network or firewire. Uh, they use a modified TFTBD daemon uh, from FreeBSD to do net dumps. Uh, and then by default, they have uh, dump compression, which is really nice. And that's both local and using their net dump. And that full procedure, like from getting to end, is available in the paper. Uh, I didn't say this before, but the same is the case with the FreeBSD procedures. So Lumos, it's not a BSD, but the features are important, uh, especially because they had ZFS before us. Uh, so they have a couple features that are really nice. Online dump size estimation. So there's a bunch of different uh, toggles you can set, like compression or um, uh, doing a live dump, things like this, or like what you're going to dump. You can choose between everything, just your processes, or just one process. And then you can talk to dump on, and you can add the dash E flag, and it'll estimate, OK, here's the settings you set. How large is this thing going to be? And that can be very useful in production. Uh, they do gzip compression. Um, they have dump to swap on zvol, which is something I'm very interested in. Because when you don't have a swap partition, but you do use ZFS, you can always add a swap to, on zvol. And then lastly, they have live dump. I'm sort of waiting to find somebody who thinks this is like the coolest feature. But while writing this, I was really interested in it. Um, so it's useful for production machines where interactive debugging is not possible, and in particular for hangs. But you can dump on a machine that stays, stays online. And so lastly, we have backtrace.io. So backtrace.io is not an operating system. It's just a tool for curating kernel and user space cores. Um, they have a really cool kind of continuation of the mini dump idea. So how, do you, how do you make these cores even smaller? Um, and so they have a thing called a snapshot. So they take your mini dump and then use some like um, intelligence to kind of figure out what parts of this uh, dump do you need and are relevant to your problem. And they'll only take those parts. Um, and snapshots also don't have the problem where you need a copy of the source and, and, the, and the environment to debug them. Uh, it allows for debugging on your laptop instead of directly on a crash machine or a very similar environment. Um, so backtrace.io, in addition, has like these, these um, since it curates everything in a database, you can ask these questions about your panics, like what panic is the most common? Uh, and then correlate those by data center, storage controller, hard drive model, timestamps, and more. Then there's a bunch of uh, core dump extension code that I'd like to go over. Uh, the first is modular dump code. That's something Rod Grimes is working on. So for embedded platforms, you might not want all these extensions. It's starting to get ridiculous, right? There's six. Um, so if you'd like to mix and match, that'd be great on an embedded platform. Uh, net dump is after that. Then we're going to do mini dump size, which is the dump sizing module. Uh, compressed dump, stripe dump, and then encrypted dumps. So a modular dump is a mix and match of features, right? You may not need net dump, but you might want your dumps compressed. Um, R. Grimes, ask R. Grimes for info. His talk contains more information, but if you're here, you're not there. So ask him afterward. So net dump. So I've been corrected, uh, but is this the name? Yeah, it's the name. OK. But by 2004, it was already Google. OK. Yeah, you have to go on the, um, the Wayback Machine, actually, to see this page. Um, but there, there's, newer, there's newer code now floating around with Mark Johnston. Um, I'll have to change this. But so this code got picked up at Sandvine, and then later at Isilon. That's where they're using it. Um, it was almost part of 
FreeBSD 9, but that never happened. Uh, Mark Johnson's still working on it. Uh, adding encrypted dumps sort of gotten in the way of upstreaming it. Uh, mini dump size is an online mini dump sizing estimation tool. It's a kernel module. It's essentially a no-op version of the mini dump code. And that allows you to figure out how large your dump is going to be in production. And that's really useful for people like me. So if I was going to figure out how large I can have, if I needed to create larger swap partitions, how large do they need to be? It turns out it's a ridiculous number. Um, Oh, I wish I had it. There's another slide here. Sorry, I moved from Beamer to uh, Keynote yesterday. But I missed this slide, yeah. So I ran this tool. It's 138 gigabytes. I'm never going to make a swap partition that big. That's ridiculous. OK, next is compressed dump. Compressed dump is confusing. Because we have save core dash z, but that's not what I'm talking about. And so even smart people like this guy here, you might recognize him, um, get this confused. So there's two, two things we could be talking about if we talk about compressed dump. The normal thing, and this is, has been around forever, was the dump process is mostly the same, except when you go from swap to your file system, it gets gzipped. And that's great. But what we're talking about is compressing it on the fly as you dump from your RAM to your swap partition. And so if you, if you gzip that on the fly, that could fix the problem I had as well. So this code exists. This also sits with Mark Johnson at, at Isilon. Um, you can get really nice compression ratios on core dumps, right, because they're not meant to be compact. So 6 to 1 to 14 to 1 compression ratios are achievable. Um, so if you get a 6 to 1 ratio and you have a 32 gigabyte core, it's now 5 gigabytes. That's a big deal. Um, the patch shouldn't be hard to apply to FreeBSD 12. Um, oh, I indicate that this is like harder than I should have. This isn't actually that bad. This should, this should happen soon. OK, so last night I was hanging out with Rod, and I fig he told me that there was actually something new I should add to my paper, which is called Stripe Dump. So most of us now, if on our like, Z root, we're running like four disks, each with some swap. And let's say this is, um, I don't know, two gigabytes each. So now, instead of only being able to write to one of these, you can stripe across them as you dump. And that can be really useful, because a lot of us ha with large RAM machines, if you have 384 gigabytes of RAM, you might have two or four disks in your Z root, but they all have a small amount of swap. If you can activate all of these, you can just add them up, and you get four times the swap. Uh, this hasn't hit my paper yet. Uh, if you'd like to learn about it, there's a long, long, long mailing list thread here. Um, in addition, Julian hints about being able to do a text dump and a real dump sequentially, which is not something you're able to do right now. Uh, this could be useful for people making um, appliances. Last is an encrypted dump. Uh, this is something that's available in FreeBSD 12. Um, so your kernel dumps can include your sensitive information, right? You might have passwords or keys sitting in RAM. Uh, so you might need encryption to protect this information if you're in an untrusted environment. Uh, so a guy named I forget, <laughs> created encrypted dump. Yeah, it's a strange name. I don't know where he's from. I think he's Polish. Um, so he currently only supports AES 256 uh, CVC. But the process is just slightly you know, uh, extended, right? So during this part over here, when we go from RAM to swap, we encrypt with a key set in rc.conf. And then later, after we do the normal save core procedure, we then run decrypt core, which I think you have to run it manually, and that'll, that'll give you your core back. Uh, the dump on eight man page example is great. It just tells you how to create your keys, tells you how to run the processes. It's easy. 
Uh, the on disk format is slightly altered from mini dump just to add in a kernel dump key and key size to the kernel dump header. Um, the kernel dump key consists of you know, what algorithm you're using, some initialization stuff, and the, the symmetric key. Uh, they changed the panic string so it's four bytes smaller. I don't think that's going to affect, affect anyone. But uh, text dumps are not supported, only full dump and mini dump. Uh, this is also not yet in the paper. This was just recently added. So there's the mailing list announcement. And then there's two proposed core dump extensions that I'm sort of gauging for interest. Uh, the first one I'm going to do anyway, whether or not you're interested. But the second one I'm interested in is, would anyone here, by a show of hands, be interested in live dump for your produ production systems? All right, we got two. Live Three. Dump. Live net dump, is that what you want? That's why we need the modular dump code. Yeah, that'd be cool. I'm still, so are you interested for the hangs or what, what, what gets for you? It would be, I mean, like, there's, it's, it's nicer than breaking into DDB and trying to poke at things. It's like if you have an on build, you have a lot of, you know, you have a lot of nodes that are doing things at once, and it would be nice to not have to install one for all the nodes that are doing things at once. Yeah. Because I think OS 10 has, has like a, um, a networked like DDB, which is really nice. It's got like the same utility as why someone would want to like core and use your base program without killing it. Exactly. Yeah, that'd be cool. So how does the live dump work? I mean, does it stop everything? No. So your dump won't be consistent. Mm -hmm. So things get weird. Because I mean, right now, if you're fast and lucky, you can, you can break into DDB and call it to the dump and continue. And sometimes it works. <laughs> <laughs> It, yeah, right. I mean, it seems to work pretty well, but yeah, your dump won't be consistent, especially the parts that you're messing with. And it seems to me that what you'd be interested in would change. I don't know. That's that's why I'm I'm asking this question. Is like, who thinks this is like really what they need? I think you're not going to know until you try it, right? So yeah. I think I think it's a, a worthy experiment at least. Totally, and you could just take another one. Yeah. If, if your first one didn't work out. Yeah, well, so you don't snapshot it, right? You just start going through it. Right. Like so there's. could be changed by some other process in the meantime if it was shared. Then. Exactly, yeah. Because otherwise, you'd have to halt your system to take that snapshot. Yeah. So you just kind of let things go, and, and hopefully it works. Um, so yeah, so the main, the main product here of this talk is actually the paper, because um, it started at, at university. Uh, it's a large org mode file, if you're familiar with Emacs. Uh, it includes like tons of commit messages, emails, and code references. Um, there's a bonus email from Jordan Hubbard that I thought was pretty funny when I asked him for help. Um, I'll let you go find it. Uh, it includes information not included in the PDF also, because there's, there's some raw notes in there that I, I wasn't ready to publish at the time of publishing. So there's actually, it's, the paper actually starts at, um, uh, version 5, and there's a bunch of other incomplete sections and stuff I thought wasn't ready for, for prime time. Um, yeah, so there's also like entire, entire files of code in there when I was trying to figure out like what feature was where, and uh, usually the file path as well. I still use that when I'm trying to reference these things. Uh, so I did want to take a look just to show you like how complete it was. I don't know where I am on time. Probably early. Yeah, this is originally a 45 minute talk, so. Let's see. So it turns out, like, when you're looking at core dump information, there's sort of other things you can glean about, like, architect support, architecture support in an operating system. So you can figure out questions like uh, when was alpha support added? Well, previous D3.0. And then you can see also when it was removed. FreeBSD 7. Um, I didn't add when Luna was taken out, but Luna 86, 68, yeah. Uh, it was added in 4.4, and you can actually see it's not in there, but it would be removed in 12. So different, different sort of like interesting things like that. It was a good, it was a good part of the operating system to 
attach a history to because it's obviously going to be there from day one to the day the operating system's done. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And so you can go find all sorts of little gems like the like emails back back and forth to me and Rod Grimes and different different um, feature support. Uh, I've got like two more slides. Uh, so here's a bunch of links. Uh, first is to my repository. Uh, next is to the uh, Unix history repo. I, I, that's where you should go take a look. That is probably my favorite repo on the internet right now. You can just go, it's just a large Git repo and each OS is a branch. And you can see how all they're, they're all connected. Uh, next is uh, Rod Grimes doing a lot of the work I talked about here. So you can find his work on kernel dumps there. Uh, I'd like to thank Deb Goodkin. I met her at a conference and that's why I'm here. Um, Rod Grimes for helping me read PDP 11 assembly. And Michael Dexter, for he actually came up with this idea that I should write this paper. And then at Asia BSD Con, he was like, you didn't thank me. So <laughs> there he is. Is there any questions? What is Mac and local crash dump support? I used to develop a driver for Mac OS and had one Mac, and it's always a pain in the butt because Because you had to network dump set, it? I had to set the catcher on my previous VBox so it kept the dumps. I don't have the whole history of uh, OS X, but it was definitely in there in um, like the latest version. So there, were, there was more change. There were two or three versions of XNU that I looked through, and there was a lot more change in that segment of code than I thought there would be. But it got cleaned up, which was nice. They added comments. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. You could actually allow the kernel to pipe user space core dumps to an external processor. So now you shift the complexity of writing the core dump out to user space. Uh, you could have, you know, in user space, you could push a lot more complexity with pipes on. So you can apply all sorts of interesting tricks. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Just for user space processes, though? Right. Okay. Yeah, that would, that would alleviate all the. Um, you wouldn't have to support it in kernel. Right. And the other cool thing is you could also build automation around that. So automatically archiving core dumps, shipping them out to centralized servers. So I feel about the hackery of uh, a cloud job. So it's crucial if you want fast response time. Well. Yeah, that's really cool. You should go talk to those backtrace.io guys. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see. All I work on is, is BSD and soon the Lumos, so. On to BSD. Oh, yeah. If, if you get at it, that'd be great. I'll, I'll think about it. I, first is dump to swap on Zvol. If I can get that, I'd be so happy. You guys, too, should volunteer on that project. <laughs> any, any more? Sorry. Right. So how do you tell that without, where is the big step from PD to not PD anymore? I'm not sure I understand. When you say live dump, do you mean like the, the uh, oh, OK. So if we can do a mini dump size estimation, why is it so hard to do a live dump? Yeah. Ah, that's not a question I know how to answer, really. Um, the live dump, I don't know really what goes into it. Uh, it might not be that hard. Um, it's just someone, I think something no one has had interest in or even knew really existed. Because I've still yet, like I said, I've still yet to find somebody who's like, man, that solved my problem. And I've talked about core dumps for like six months nonstop. <laughs> did, did you ever, did you look at all of how Linux does their kernel crash dumps? No, that. It's, it's Another kernel image, 
So you load essentially a kernel image in a, in a very tiny disk image into, say, 64 or 128 megs of RAM. You otherwise, never ever use it. You throw this memory away. Mm -hmm. And then when you pan it, you jump into this new kernel that's supposedly pristine and everything's fine because, you know, nothing can overwrite this 128 megs of memory somehow. And then, and then it runs, and it boots up, it boots up a kernel, and its, own, its only job is to, it has to dump. Yeah, I actually heard about that when uh, Michael Dexter was like, you know what they should do is just load another kernel. And we're like, ha, 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 that's ridiculous. And then, then we found about this. And it's, it's actually ridiculously complicated because it typically works. Yeah. Well, it's, so what happens when that panics? There's like 1K of memory for this tiny, tiny kernel. <laughs> 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 yeah. There you go. It turtles all the way down. Yeah. We thought that was so funny, but it would be nice for adding all this functionality because you have this clean state instead of like sort of picking up the pieces when your when you're kernel panics. The thing is, you don't really know what to do. Right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, things get weird once you're in panic context. Is there any other any other questions? All right. Well, thanks for coming. Sorry I ran a bit short. <laughs>